Hello, and welcome to the Murder House Radio Show. I'm your host, X. On this show, we will be covering serial killers, killers, mass shooters, disappearances, true crime, and the most deplorable things in people in history, and all that good, dark stuff. The Murder House Radio Show will be a radio show slash podcast. I'll be uploading videos every Friday at 4 p.m. Mountain Standard Time. Make sure you hit the like and subscribe button. Once you hit the subscribe button, hit the bell notification and select all to get all notifications if you are viewing on YouTube. And hit follow if you are listening on a podcasting platform. So sit down, get comfortable, grab some coffee or whatever your preferred beverage is, turn off the lights and enjoy the show. Today's episode will be on Jeffrey Dahmer. His full name is Jeffrey Luonel Dahmer. L-I-O-N-E-L Dahmer. And before we get too far into this, I want to say, don't mind any background noise if you hear it. I'm in the laundry room. That's where my room is. And the dryer's running. And... I'm also reading off a website. The link will be in the description below, so I will not be reading the whole thing to avoid copyright or anything like that. So let's get in to this episode. Jeffrey Dahmer was born May 21st, 1960, and he died in November 28th, 1994. He was also known as the Milwaukee Cannibal, or the Milwaukee Monster. He was a convicted American serial killer and sex offender, which is no good. I'd rather be housed with a serial killer than a sex offender. But uh, he committed crimes and murder. Well, duh, committed crimes. He committed murders and dismemberment of 17 men that they know of. Men and boys from 1978 to 1991. Many of his later murders involved necrophilia, cannibalism, and the permanent preservation of body parts, typically all or parts of the skeleton. So uh, for those of you who don't know, necrophilia is where they fuck dead bodies, basically. And uh, cannibalism, they eat the people. They eat people. <clears throat> he was diagnosed with borderline personality disorder. Person, borderline personality disorder. Sorry, guys. Uh, yeah, the, I'm stumbling over my words because uh, I did a video for my first channel and it was like 30 minutes worth of reading or whatever, so you know. But uh, yeah, borderline personality disorder, schi- schizotypal schizotypal personality disorder that's an interesting one so sp stpd also known as schizotypal disorder is in personality disorder characterized by thought disorder paranoia and characteristics from the social anxiety derealization transient psychosis and in unconventional beliefs okay word that's uh, interesting. I've never heard of that. And I did not know that. Uh, that is news to me. And a psychotic disorder, obviously. But, um, yeah. Dahmer was found to be legally sane at his trial. He was convicted of 15 of the 16 murders he had committed in Wisconsin. And was sentenced to 15 terms of life in prison. And on February 15th, 1992, Dahmer was later sentenced to a 16th term of life in prison for an additional homicide in Ohio in 1978. Um, On November 28th, when he died, he was beaten to death by Christopher Scarver, Scarver, Christopher Scarver, a fellow inmate at the Columbia... Columbia Correctional Institution in Portage, Washington, Wisconsin. Portage, Wisconsin. But, uh, yeah, I saw an interview 
with the dude who beat him to death, who was also later murdered in prison, I believe, and I saw an interview with the dude who beat Dahmer to death's son. If that made any sense, I hope it did for y'all. Sorry if that was a little confusing, but uh, yeah, it's uh, definitely interesting. But that's a recap on who Jeffrey Dahmer is. So uh, let's dive into his early life and childhood and that type of stuff. So I said earlier when he was born and where. So he was the first of two sons of Joy Sanet and a tele type machine instructor. What? Oh, so his mother was a tele type instructor. So which is a. Uh, electronic channel device that can be used to send and receive type messages so like the very early stages of email basically kind of i think <laughs> and lonnie herbert dahmer uh mary a marchetti university chemist student word lonnie dahmer was of german and welsh ancestry and Joyce Dahmer was of Norwegian and Irish ancestry. Interesting. It has been claimed that Dahmer was deprived of attention as an infant. Oof. Other sources, however, suggest that Dahmer was generally doted upon as an infant and taught there by both parents, although his mother was known to be a tense, gre greedy uh, for both attention and pity. Oh. Okay, an argument and argumentative with her husband and their neighbors. Okay, so sounds like the mom was a bit of an attention whore, and it sounds like also that they might have been uh, kind of neglectful. I think that might be the right word, but um, yes. When Dahmer was entering his first grade year, Joyce began to spend an increasing amount of time in bed recovering from weakness. What? Weakness. Interesting. So maybe like an illness or something, not something like that. <clears throat> Lonnie's university studies kept him away from home much of the time. So both of the parents seem to be uh, inactive in his life, like a majority or when he was home with his wife, a hypochondric, <laughs> H-Y-P-O-C-H-O-N-D-R-I-A-C, who suffered from depression, demanded constant attention. She reportedly worked herself into a state of anxiety over trivial matters simply to earn appeasement from her husband oh so she's definitely an attention whore. no offense <laughs> on one occasion she is known to have attempted suicide with equinol equinil equinil um metprobamin market as milltown by wallace laboratories Laboratories, Wallace of Laboratories, and Equinol by, okay, is a, ah, ah, is a carbonate derivative used as an anxiolytic drug. It is, it was the best-selling minor tranquilizer for the time, but has largely been replaced by the Benzodiapines due to their wider range of abilities, I guess, word. So it was technically like a Xanax, maybe, kind of deal. Uh, ch -ch -ch. Consequently, neither parent devoted much time to their son, who later <laughs> recollected that from an early age he felt unsure of the solidarity of the family. Oof, that's sad. Recalling extreme tension and numerous arguments between his parents during his early years. So his earliest memories is uh, arguments and trauma. That's pretty sad. So he was regarded as being an energetic and happy child. But after a sudden like double hernia surgery shortly before his first uh, 
fourth birthday, he became, um, like, withdrawn, I guess, in a shell of his former self, I guess you could say. At elementary school, Dahmer was regarded as quiet and timid. One teacher later recalled she detected early signs of abandonment in Dahmer due to his mother's illness, the symptoms of which increased when she became pregnant with her second child. So the poor guy just needed attention and he probably could have avoided a lot of stuff, it sounds like. Nonetheless, in grade school, Dahmer did have a small number of friends, which is good, that's good. From an early age, Dahmer manifested an interest in dead animals. Oof. He initially collected large insects such as dragonflies and butterflies in jars. Kind of normal right there, just not the dead animal part. Later, he collected animal carcasses, occasionally accompanied by one or more friends. He dismembered these animals either at home or in nearby woodland. According to one friend, Dahmer dismembered dismembered these animals and stored the plastic, the parts in jars in the family tool shed. Oof. Imagine walking into the tool shed and there's just a bunch of dead animals in jars. Explaining that he was curious to see how the animals fitted together. Ooh. His uh, fascination with dead animals may have been made and be... Ah! May have begun when... At an age of four, he saw his father removing animal bones from beneath the family home. Huh, interesting. According to Loney, Dahmer was oddly thrilled by the sound of bones. May, this, by the, he was fascinated, fascinated by the sound bones made and became preoccupied with animal bones. And he occasionally searched beneath and around the family home for additional bones and exploring the bodies of living animals to discover where their bones were located. Huh. That's a, a bit weird. One time, Dahmer decapitated the carcass of a dog before nailing the body to a tree and impaling the skull on a stick beside the wooden cross in the woodlands behind his house. Damn, that's that's worrisome. You should probably go see someone for that. Especially if people knew. Like, especially if you're interested in animals and, like, cutting them up and shit. Like, before the age of, like, I don't know. Whenever, before the age of, like, whenever you're in school and doing, like, science and, like, biology. If, if you're doing that stuff before then, you should definitely go get some help. <laughs> When he was six years old, his he and his family moved to Doyle Town, Idaho, Ohio, not Idaho, <laughs> Ohio. And um, when the mom gave birth to his uh, sibling, they allowed Jeffrey to uh, choose the name of his baby brother. He chose the name David. The same year, Lonnie earned his degree and started working as an analytical chemist in the nearby Acorn, Ohio. Interesting. Very interesting. In 1968, they moved again to Bath Township, Summit County, Ohio, two years later. Yes, that's what it just said. Huh. But, uh, yes. During dinner one time, Dahmer asked Lonnie, what would happen if the chicken bones were placed in bleach? Lonnie, pleased by his son's curiosity, demonstrated how to safely bleach and preserve animal bones. Dahmer incorporated these preserving techniques into his bone collection. Oof. That same year, Joyce began increasing her daily consumption of equaline, Laxatives and sleeping pills. Oof, that's not good. Further minimizing her tranquility contact with her husband and children. Ooh, that's, yeah, that's not good at all. Not good at all. But, um, he's, 
it seems like the dad was doing this out of uh, innocence or whatever. Like, he was like, hey, he's interested in my work or whatever, my area of expertise. So he taught him or whatever, which is understandable. And, um, yeah, you know, kids are curious. And back then, there wasn't much TV. There wasn't internet or anything like that. So, you know. But, like, nowadays, if you watch, like, the Discovery Channel or something... All this is perfectly logical and uh, normal, just minus cutting apart dead animals and stuff, you know? So in high school, Dahmer was seen as an outcast, and by 14, he had begun drinking beer and hard alcohol in daylight hours. Oof, he was a day drinker, frequently concealing his liquor inside a lining of his army fatigue jacket he wore to school. I remember doing that in grade 7 and 8-ish. <laughs> Mostly grade 8 and 9, not 7. I used to blaze a lot too, but I don't anymore. He was known to have referred to one classmate that his alcohol was my medicine. Oof, real sad tings. Although largely uncommunicative, in his freshman year, Dahmer was seen by staff as polite and highly intelligent, by a, but with average grades. So maybe not too book smart, but he was a smart dude. He was a keen tennis player and played briefly in the high school band. Interesting. Very interesting. And later, he uh, when he reached puberty, he found out he was gay, which is, there's nothing wrong with that. But he didn't tell his parents or really anyone. In his early teens, he had a brief relationship with another teenage boy, although they never had intercourse. Mm -hmm. By his later admission, Dahmer began fantasizing about dominating and controlling a complete rendering unconscious of a particular male jogger. Oof. So right into the hardcore shit, eh? Um, he found, so he found that jogger attractive and then um, making sexual use of his body. Oof. On um, one day... Dahmer concealed himself in the bushes on the jogging path with a baseball bat. However, the jogger did not come by that day. Dahmer later said this was his first attempt to attack someone. Oof. That's, uh, gnarly. Despite the fact he was regarded as a loner and an outcast or whatever amongst his peers, at RHS, Dahmer became something of a class clown who often staged pranks which became known as doing a Dahmer. Yes, he was a verb, I believe. That's what you call that. <clears throat> These included bleeding and stimulating epileptic seizures or cerebral palsy. Okay. Okay, then. At school and local stores. Hmm. In 1977, well, by then, Dahmer's grades had declined. His parents hired a private tutor with limited success, and the same year, in an attempt to save their marriage, his parents attended counseling sessions. Okay. They qu they continued to quarrelly frequently. Okay. To so they attended these things, the counseling, pretty frequently-ish. When Lonnie discovered Joyce had engaged in a brief affair in September 1977, they both decided to divorce makes sense, telling their son they wish to do so ambically, hope I said that right, Lonnie moved out of the house in 1978, and in May 1978, oh yes, in May 1978, Dahmer graduated from high school a few weeks before his graduation, one of his teachers observed Dahmer sitting close to the school parking lot drinking several cans of beer when the teacher threatened to report the matter. Dahmer informed him he was experiencing a lot of problems at home and that the school's guidance counselor was aware of them. That spring, Joyce and David moved out of the family home to live with relatives. Dahmer had just turned 18 and remained there by himself at the family home. Interesting. So, uh, Dahmer's parents' divorce was finalized in, uh, July, on July 24th, 1978. Joyce was awarded custody of her younger son in alimony payments. All right. Word. 
I um also heard this story. It was like a on a scary story video on YouTube where this um girl went to a prom date or whatever with Jeffrey Dahmer or whatever. And it sounds like she made it sound like he was going to try and cause her harm because he was being awkward and quiet or whatever the whole time. And he tried to get her to go back to his apartment or to his place or whatever, but she didn't. And then a few weeks later or whatever, he killed his uh, first person or whatever. It was uh, pretty wild. If you search up rare Bridget Grieger, Jeffrey Dahmer documentary or something like that, it should come up. That might be the chick. It says Jeffrey Dahmer's prom date, so... You know, search that up if you want. It might be interesting. I haven't watched that video in particular, but that's what came up when I searched up Jeffrey Dahmer's prom date. When Dahmer committed his first murder in 1978, he was 18. He did this three weeks after his graduation. Holy, starting off your adulthood with a murder. Fucking mint. Just kidding. At the time, he was living alone in the family home. Yeah, following their decision to divorce, they temporarily lived near in a nearby motel, and Joyce had relocated to Chippewa Falls, Wisconsin, with Jeffrey's younger brother David. On June eighteenth, Dahmer picked up a hitchhiker named Stephen Mark Hicks, whose first victim, who is almost nineteen, so close in age. Dahmer lured the boy to his house on the pretext of the two young men drinking alcohol. Hicks, who had been hitchhiking to a rock concert at Chippewack Lake Park, Ohio, greeted, agreed to accompany Dahmer to his house upon the promise of a few beers with Dahmer, and they went to the house. According to Dahmer, the sight of the uh, bare chest Hicks Standing at the roadside steered his sexual feelings, although when Hicks began talking about girls, he knew any sexual passes he made would be denied because he was straight. After several hours of talking, drinking, and listening to music, Hicks wanted to leave, and Dahmer didn't want him to. In response, Dahmer bludgeoned Hicks with a 10-pound dumbbell. What a way. Oh yeah, I used to have those kind of dumbbells too. They were the kind where you uh, put the weights on and screw the thing on so you can uh, alter the weights. He later stated he struck Hicks twice from behind, then the dump, then with the dumbbell as Hicks sat upon a chair. So he hit him when he was sitting in a chair. When Hicks fell unconscious, Dahmer strangled him to death with the bar of the dumbbell. Oof. Then stripped the clothes off Hicks' body before exploring his chest with his okay, he's feeling him, feeling him up, and he uh, masturbated as he stood over the body. Oof. The following day, Dah Dahmer dissected Hicks's body in the basement. He later buried the remains in a shallow grave in his backyard before several weeks later, unearthing the remains and uh, paring the flesh from the bones. He dissolved the flesh in acid before flushing the solution down the toilet. He crushed the bones with a sledgehammer and scattered them in the woods behind his house. So that's his first murder. That's a pretty gnarly first murder, but it only gets worse. It would be a while till his next murder, and that's uh, somewhat common. Serial killers will go on like a little spree. They'll sometimes take a break to let the heat die down or go somewhere else or whatever. Sometimes they'll try to stop altogether because um, I'm pretty sure Ed Kemper also tried to stop or whatever. Well, he did. He uh, turned himself in. But um, Dahmer went to college and then the army. I'm pretty sure he is in the Navy. But six weeks after the murder, Dahmer's father and his fiance returned to his house. To Dahmer's house, a family home, where they discovered Jeffrey living alone at the house. That August, Dahmer enrolled at Ohio State University. <sighs> Excuse me. Hoping to enroll in business. Dahmer's sole term at the university was completely unproductive. Largely because of his persistent alcohol abuse throughout the majority of the term. He received failing grades in Introduction to Anthropology, Classical 
civilizations and administrative science. The only course Dahmer su- was successful at was uh, riffolery. Riffolery, whatever that is. Having received a B- grade, so it's not that bad. That's like just above passing. So maybe like just above 65%. I'm not too sure. His overall GPA was 0.45 slash 0.4.0. Um, on one occasion, Lonnie paid a, survi- a surprise visit to his son only to find his room strewn with empty liquor bottles. Despite his father having paid in advance for the second term, Dahmer dropped out just after three months in school. Oof. So, Dahmer's father urged him to join the United States Army, so not the Navy, in January 1979. So, maybe he joined the Army, like he got urged to join the Army for some uh, level of discipline and try to get his life on track kind of deal. So, he is trained as a medical specialist at the Fort Sam Houston in San Antonio, Texas. On July 13th, 1979, he was stationed in Baumholder, Baumholder, West Germany. There, he served as a combat medic in the 2nd Battalion, 68th Armored Regiment, and 8th Infantry Division. Nice. Fun fact, I was going to join the army, but that uh, didn't work out too well. I wanted to be infantry and special forces. That would have been lit. According to published reports in Dahmer's first year of service, he was an average or slightly above average soldier, soldier, which isn't too bad. So he's doing good for quite a while. But uh, yeah, if I joined the army, maybe I wouldn't... Uh, have started my YouTube channels, and maybe you wouldn't be here listening to me right now. Maybe this is my calling, I guess you could say. But even in the army, his dark fantasies haven't ceased. Two soldiers um, accused Dahmer of raping them while in the army. One stated in 2010 that Dahmer had repeatedly raped him over a 17-month period while they were both stationed in Germany, while another soldier believes Dahmer drugged and raped him inside an armored personnel carrier in 1979. Owing to Dahmer's alcohol abuse, his performance deteriorated and he was, uh... Deemed unsuitable for military service in March 1981 and was later discharged from the army. Oof. He uh, received an honorable discharge as his superiors did not believe that any problems Dahmer had in the army were to be applicable to civilian life, okay? But uh, yeah, lots of uh, soldiers and military personnel suffer from uh, alcohol abuse. That's a big problem. Some of them didn't go in as alcoholics, but some of them leave as alcoholics, which is sad. So he returned home and lived with his father and stepmother. And uh, he started doing a lot of chores looking for work. He continued to heavily drink, and two weeks after his return, Dahmer was arrested for drunk and disorderly conduct, for which he was fined $60 and given a suspended 10-day jail sentence. Dahmer's father tried unsuccessfully to wean his son off alcohol, so his father was trying to get him on a better path, which is good. And in December 1981, he and Dahmer's stepmother sent him to live with his grandmother, where he would go on to uh, kill people and leave their bodies in the basement, buried, and later, uh, you know, do stuff. Dahmer's grandmother was the only family member whom displayed any affection. Oof. They hoped that her influence, plus the change of scenery, might persuade Dahmer to refrain from alcohol and find a job and live responsibly. Well, good intentions. Good intentions. What are your all thoughts on his uh, interview with his father and that one news reporter? I forget what it's called, but what are your thoughts on that, if you know what I'm talking about? Leave them in the comments below. 
So, at first, when he was living with his grandmother, it was pretty harmonious. He went to her with church, willingly undertook chores, actively sought work, and abided by most of her house rules, although he did continue to drink and smoke. This new influence in his life initially brought results, and in the early in early 1882, 1882, Dahmer found a job as a phlebotomist, P-H-L-E-B-O-T-O-M-I-S-T, at the Milwaukee Blood F- Plasma Center. So he was uh, basically taking people's blood, I guess you could say. He helped this. Jo- he held this job for a total of ten months before being uh, laid off. Word. So he didn't get fired. They just kind of let him go for whatever reason. But um, he remained unemployed for two years, during which he lived upon whatever money his grandmother gave him. Oof. I feel that sometimes. Um, by the way, I'm 19, so uh, I'm still looking for a job or whatever. But, uh, yeah. Just sl- just sh- slowly but surely tra- dropping hints to who I am. So, you know, if you listen to these, you'll piece it together eventually. And maybe if you find my uh, second channel. Well, my first, my main channel, you know. Before losing his job, he was arrested for indecent exposure. Oof. So that's like when people do streaking and shit, so they're just naked in public. So this was on August 7th, 1982, at Wisconsin State Fair Park. He was observed exposing himself to a crowd of 25 women and children. Oof. (laughs) I hope he was drunk for that. From this instance, he was convicted and fined $50 plus court costs. Oof. Um, in 1985, he was hired as a mixer at the Milwaukee abs- at the Milwaukee Chocolate Factory, where he worked from 11 p.m. till 7 a.m. six nights a week, so the night shift, with Saturday evenings off. Shortly after. He found this employment in insistent occurred an incident occurred in which he was propositioned by another man while sitting reading in the West Alice Public Library. Oh. The stranger threw Dahmer a note offering to perform fellatio, so give him a head. And although Dahmer did not respond to this proposition, the incident stirred in his mind. And the fantasies of control and dominance had developed as a teenager began to surface once again. Oof. So then he started frequenting gay bars and gay bathhouses and bookstores. He is also known to have stolen a male mannequin from a store. Okay then. (laughs) Which he briefly used as a sexual stimulation. Didn't they have sex dolls back then? I'm pretty sure they did, but maybe not for guys. Well, not for gay guys, anyway. Until his grandmother discovered the item stowed in the closet and demanded that he discard it. (laughs) Imagine finding a fucking mannequin with, like, sex holes in it in, like, someone you live with's closet. That'd be weird. I'd be like, okay, then. I'm just gonna pretend I didn't fucking see that. (laughs) So, after a bathhouse pass was revoked, he read in a newspaper article about the upcoming funeral of an 18-year-old boy, and he wa- he made a plan and went through with it to go dig up the freshly buried corpse and take it home, but he ended up not doing it because when he attempted to, the dirt was too hard and he gave up. But uh, that's, uh, that's weird. In 1986, he was arrested for masturbating in front of a 12-year-old boys, in front of two 12-year-old boys, as he stood close to the Kinnikerinik River. Didn't say that right, but you know, just YOLO. (laughs) 
He initially admitted to the offense and was again charged with indecent exposure, but quickly changed his story and claimed he had merely been urinating, unaware that there were witnesses. Oof. The charge was changed to disorderly conduct, and uh, he was sentenced to one year of probation with additional instructions he was to undergo counseling. I think that right there should have put him on the sex offender registry, that alone. So, he started killing again in November 20th, 1987. He was still living with his grandmother at her house when he met 25, a 25-year-old man from Antoganang? On, Antonagano, <laughs> Michigan. Yeah, I didn't say that right, but, you know, I'm sorry if you lived there, and I butch I definitely butchered the shit out of that. But his name was Stephen Tuomi. Tuomi. He met him at a bar and pressured him into returning to his hotel room where he, uh, that he had rented for the evening. And according to Dahmer later on in an interview or whatever, he did not intend on murdering Tuomi, but rather drugging him and raping him while he was unconscious. The following morning, however, Dahmer awoke to find Tuami laying beneath him on the bed, so I think Dahmer was probably on top of him, passed out. His chest crushed in and black and blue with bruises. Blood was also seeping from the corners of his mouth, and Dahmer's fists and one of his forearms were extensively bruised. And Dahmer stated he had no memory of killing Tuami, and later informed investigators that he could not believe that this has happened. So it sounds like he didn't want to start killing at first. But, uh, yeah. And, uh, ch -ch -ch fuck, what was I gonna fucking say? Hold on. Oh, yeah, so, um, he basically crushed his chest to death or whatever, and probably fucked his heart somehow. Not literally, if maybe, I don't know. But, uh, yeah. And then, uh, to dispose of the body, he purchased a large suitcase in which he transported the body back to his grandmother's house. There, one week later, he severed the head, arms, legs from the torso, then, uh, filled the bo filed the bones from the body before cutting the flesh into small pieces enough to handle. So he cut up the body, separated the meat from the bones... Then uh, Dahmer placed the flesh inside plastic garbage bags. He wrapped the bones inside sheets and pounded them into splinters with a sludge hammer. The entire dismemberment process took Dahmer approximately two hours to complete, and he disposed of all of the body remains, excluding the severed head in the trash. Oof. So for a total of two weeks following the murder, Dahmer... Retained the victim's head wrapped in a blanket. After two weeks, Dahmer boiled the head in a mixture of sol solex, solex and alkaline-based industrial detergent and bleached it in an effort to retain the skull, which he used to stimulate for masturbation. So he basically skull-fucked the head after he preserved it. Um, eventually the skull rendered to be brittle by this bleaching process, so Dahmer, per, he disposed of it, because it was uh, not pleasuring enough, because of what he did to it. After this murder, Dahmer began to, uh, seek victims frequently, most of whom were encountered in or close proximity to gay bars, and who were typically lured to his grandmother's home. There, he drugged them before or shortly after engaging in sexual activities with them. Once he had rendered the victims unconscious with sleeping pills, he killed them by strangulation. At least that's not too bad of a way to go. Just, you know, falling asleep and never waking up, literally. But it'd be creepy as fuck, though. But uh, two months after the Tomi... Tuomi killing, Dahmer encountered a 14-year-old Native American male prostitute named James Doxtorito. Dahmer lured the young boy to his home and offered $50 to pose for nude pictures. 
at Dahmer's West at his residence or whatever, the pair engaged in sexual activity before Dahmer drugged him and strangled him on the floor of the cellar. Ooh. Dahmer left the body in the cellar for one week before dismembering it, much the same as he did with Tuami. He placed all of the remains, exclusively the skull, so he kept the head in the trash. He boiled the skull and initially retained it before pulverizing it. Okay. And on um, March 24th, 1988, he met a 22-year-old bisexual man named Richard Giario, G-U-E-R-R-E-R-O, outside a gay bar called The Phoenix. Dahmer lured him to his grandmother's house, although the incentive on this occasion was $50 to simply spend the remainder of the night with him. Okay. So he's buying a friend, basically. He then drugged him with sleeping pills, strangled him with a leather strap, with Dahmer then performing oral sex upon the corpse. Oof. His body was dismembered within 24 hours of his murder, with the remains again disposed of in the trash, and the skull again retained before being pulverized several months later. On April 3rd, he lured another young man to his house. However... After giving the victim the drugged coffee, both he and the victim heard Dahmer's grandmother call, Is that you, Jeff? Although Dahmer replied in a manner that led his grandmother to believe he was alone, she did observe that Dahmer was not alone. Because of this, Dahmer opted not to kill the victim, instead waiting until he had become unconscious before taking him to the hospital. Okay... That's lucky as fuck. That is lucky. It doesn't say this victim's name, but he's one of the surviving victims. Very lucky. In September 1988, his grandmother told him, well, asked him to move out because his habits of bringing young men to her house late at night and the foul smell emanating from both the basement and the garage... Okay, so Dahmer found a one-bedroom apartment, his notorious apartment, on North 25th Street and moved in into his new residence on September 25th. So his notorious apartment, I think it was, what, room 113 or room 13? Um, the following day, he was arrested for drugging and sexually fondling a 13-year-old boy who he had lured to his home on the pretext of posing for nude photos. So child porn and child, well, child molestation. Not a good look, bud. Not a good fucking look at all. In January 1989, Dahmer was convicted on second-degree sexual assault and on enticing the child, and enticing a child for immoral purposes. And sentencing for the assault was suspended until May 1989. On March 20th, Dahmer was uh, commenced to a 10-day Easter abstinence from work, during which he moved back in with his grandmother. Um, okay. Just a second. Let me, uh, read that again, and if, uh, I'll make sense of it, and then, uh, explain what the fuck I just read. <laughs> okay, so he took Easter off of work for, like, two, uh, ten days, and moved back in with his grandmother, word. So two months after this... And two months prior to his sentencing for the sexual assault, Dahmer murdered his fifth victim. He was a mixed-race 24-year-old aspiring model named Anthony Sears. My wa uh, dryer just ended, so that was what that noise was, if you heard it. Um, so, whom Dahmer met at a gay bar on March 25th, 1989. According to Dahmer, on this particular case, he was not looking to commit a crime. However, shortly before closing time that evening, Sears just started talking to me. So, Sears came up and talked to him, and Dahmer wasn't looking for anybody in particular. He was just kind of doing his own Dahmer thing. 
without the murder, I guess. Dahmer lured Seer to his grandmother's house, where the pair engaged in oral sex before Dahmer drugged and strangled Sears. The following morning, Dahmer placed the corpse in his grandmother's bathtub, where he decapitated the body before attempting to flee the corpse. He then stripped the flesh from the body and pulverized the bones, which were again disposed of in the trash. According to Dahmer, he found Sears exceptionally attractive, and Sears was the first victim victim from whom he permanently retained any body parts. He preserved Sears' head and gen and genitalia in so he preserved that in a ac acetone or propanone is an organic compound. It is the simplest and smallest it is in color Okay, word. so he just basically preserved it in that chemical and stored them in his work locker. Oof. When he moved to a new address the following year, he took the remains there. All right. On May 23rd, 1989, Dahmer was sentenced to five years probation and one year in the House of Corrections with work release permitted in order that he is able to keep his job he was also required to register as a sex offender finally but i think he should have was i think he should have been just sentenced to straight prison or whatever cuz you know fuck child sex crime peoples and you know it would have been better he probably wouldn't have committed any murders well further murders in that time if he did but um 2 months before his scheduled release from the work camp Dahmer was paroled from his regime his five years probation started in 1989, and on release, Dahmer temporarily moved back with his grandmother in her house before, in May 1990, moving into the Oxford apartments located on North 25th Street in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Although located in a high crime area, the apartment was close to his workplace was furnished and cost $300 per month inclusive of all bills excluding electricity was economical. That's what I need for my first apartment, boys, when I finally move out. That's cheap, $300 a month, but I don't know what that would get you nowadays. <laughs> so from 1990 till 1991, Dahmer moved into his apartment, the notorious murder apartment, and he brought the Sears mummified head with him. And during that period, he, he went on to kill about... In 1990, he went on to kill five vict well, four victims and then didn't kill for another five months. With these five victims and then the others in 1991, are where he performed his most grotesque acts. We'll get into those. And in 1991, he killed about six victims. So, uh, yeah, we'll get into the details here right now. Within one week of moving into his new apartment, he killed his sixth victim, Raymond Smith. He was a 32-year-old male prostitute who Dahmer lured to his apartment, 231, there it was. I knew it was, thir well, 231, 213, my bad, guys. I knew it was 13-something, with the proposition of $50 for sex. Inside the apartment, he gave Smith a drink laced with seven sleeping pills and manually strangled him. The following day, Dahmer purchased a Polaroid camera and he took several pictures of Smith's body in suggestive positions before dismembering him in the bathroom. If you want to search it up, you really, if you really want to, you can search up Dahmer's Polaroid photos of the dead bodies and Dahmer's crime scene apartment photos, and you'll see some truly disturbing stuff. I don't recommend it, but if you want to, you can. He boiled the legs, arms, and pelvis in a, st a steel kettle with Soloxy Soliex, which allowed him to then rinse the bones in the sink. Dahmer dissolved the remain, the remainder of Smith's skeleton, excluding the skull in a container filled with acid. 
he later spray painted Smith's skull, which he placed alongside the skull of Sears upon a black towel inside a metal cabinet. And approximately one week after the murder of Smith, on about May 27th, Dahmer lured another young man to his apartment. On this occasion, however, Dahmer himself accidentally consumed the drink laden with the sedatives intended for the victim. He wo awoke the following day. He discovered his intended victim had stolen several items from his clothing. $300 a watch and a watch, so he got played. <laughs> Dahmer never reported the incident to police, obviously. Although on May 29th, he divulged to his probation officer that he had been robbed. In June 1990, Dahmer lured a 27-year-old acquaintance named Edward Smith to his apartment. Apartment. He drugged and strangled him on his on this t uh, occasion, rather than immediately assifying the skeleton or repeating previous procedures of bleaching which had rendered previous victim skulls brittle Dahmer placed Smith's skeleton in his freezer for several months in the hopes it would not retain moisture freezing the skeleton did not remove moisture the skeleton of the victim would be acidified several months later Dahmer accidentally destroyed the skull when he placed it in the oven to dry and process proceeded a process that caused the skull to explode. Oof. <laughs> Damn. Imagine that. That probably scared the fuck out of him. Dahmer himself was too late to later inform police that he had felt rotten about Smith's murder, as he had been unable to retain any parts of his body. Less than three months after the Smith murder, Dahmer encountered another boy, 22 years old, a Chicago, a Chicago native named Ernest Miller on the corner of North 27th Street. Miller agreed to accompany Dahmer back to his apartment for $50 and further agreed to allow him to listen to his heartbeat and stomach. That's weird. When Dahmer attempted to perform oral sex upon Miller, he was informed that'll cost you extra, whereupon Dahmer gave him the intended victim the drink laced with two sleeping pills on this occasion Dahmer had two sleeping pills to give to his victim therefore he killed Miller by slashing his carotid artery so this one was a little messy the killing I guess you could say with the same knife he used to dissect his victim's bodies Miller bled to death within minutes Dahmer then posed the nude body for various suggestive Polaroid photos before placing the body in the bathtub for dismemberment. Dahmer repeatedly kissed and talked to the severed head while he dismembered the remains of the body. Oof. Ima like, imagine that. Being in a bathtub, taking a shower, even a bath, and there's been a body dismembered in there. Like, his poor grandmother, but, like, imagine that. That's why I don't like showering in people's places. <laughs> you never know, man. You never know. Dahmer put the his heart, biceps, and portions of flesh from the legs in plastic bags and kept them in the fridge to eat later on. He boiled the remaining flesh and organs into a jelly-like substance using Solilex. Which again enabled him to rinse and f rinse the flesh off the skeleton, which he intended to retain. To preserve the skeleton, Dahmer placed the bones in a large bleach salute a large bleach solution for twenty four hours before allowing them to dry upon a cloth for one week. The severed head was initially placed in the refrigerator before also being stripped of flesh, then painted and coated with enamel. Oof. Three weeks after this murder, on September 24th, Dahmer encountered another 22-year-old man named Davis Thomas at the Grand Avenue Mall and persuaded him to return to his apartment with him for a few drinks with additional money on offer if he would pose for photographs. 
In his statement to police after his arrest, Dahmer stated that after giving Thomas a drink laden with sedatives, he did not feel attracted to him, but after but afraid to allow him to awake in case he would be angry over having being drugged. Well, I'd be pretty fucking pissed if I got drugged. Therefore, he strangled him and dismembered the body, intentionally retaining no body parts whatsoever. The, he photographed the, dismembered, the dismemberment process and retained these photographs, which later aided in Thomas's subsequent identification. Oof. Following the t murder of Thomas, he did not kill anyone for five months, like I said earlier. Although on a minimum of five occasions between October 1990 and February 1991, he unsuccessfully attempted to lure men into his apartment. He is also known to have regularly complained of feeling of both anxiety and depression to his probation officer throughout 1990, with frequent references to his sexuality, his solitary lifestyle, and financial difficulties. On several occasions, Dahmer is known to have referred to harboring suicidal thoughts. Oof. So, uh, yeah, there's that. There's the 1990 murders. So, in February of 1991, he observed 17-year-old Curtis, Curtis, Curtis Strader at a bus stop near uh, the a university, and he lured him to his apartment with the guise of money for posing for nude photos, with the added incentive for sexual intercourse. Dahmer drug strangled and drugged and strangled Slaughter with a leather strap, and dismembered him with Dahmer's retaining the youth's skull, hands, and genitals and photographing each stage of the dismemberment process. Less than two months later, on April 7th, Dahmer encountered a 19-year-old, Harold Lindsay, a guy, walking to get a key cut. Lindsay was heterosexual, so straight. Dahmer lured Lindsay to his apartment where he drugged him, drilled a hole in his skull, poured hydraulic acid into it, so he's trying to make a sex zombie. These are the more graphic ones. According to Dahmer, Lindsay awoke after the experiment, which Dahmer had convinced in the hope of including a permanent, unresistant, submissive state, saying, I have a headache. What time is it? In response to this, Dahmer again shrugged Lindsay. Yes, Lindsay. Then strangled him. He decapitated Lindsay, then retained his skull. He then filleted Lindsay's body, placing the skin in a solution of cold water and salt for several weeks in the hopes of permanently retaining it. Reluctantly, he disposed of Lindsay's skin when he noted it had become frayed and brittle. I wonder what he would have done with that. You think he would have wore it? <laughs> um... By 1991, fellow residents of the apartment had repeatedly complained about the smell to the building manager. So, uh, in addition to sounds of falling objects and occasional sounds of chainsaws. Yeah, imagine hearing a chainsaw in an apartment in the middle of Chicago or Wisconsin, wherever this was. Yes, Wisconsin. So, um, he, the building manager contacted Dahmer in response to these complaints on several occasions, although he initially excused the odor emanating from his apartment as being caused by his freezer breaking, causing contents to become spoiled. One, on later occasions, he informed the manager that the reason for the resurgence of the odor was that several of his tropical fish had recently died. So it must have been some big fish, bro. And that he would take care of the matter. Hmm. On the afternoon of May 5th, or oh, May 26th, 1991, Jeffrey Dahmer encountered a 14-year-old boy, Leo, a Leo, a 14-year-old Leo teenager named Konerak Synthestophone, Synthestophone, on Wisconsin Avenue by a coincidence. Sinfostoson was the younger boy, the younger 
brother of the boy whom Dahmer had molested in 1988. Okay. He approached the youth with an offer of money to accompany him to his apartment to pose for Polaroid pictures. According to Dahmer, Cynthia Stofone was initially reluctant to the proposal before changing his mind and accompanying Dahmer to his apartment, where the youth posed for two pictures in his underwear before Dahmer drugged him into unconsciousness and performed oral sex on him. On this occasion, Dahmer drilled a single hole into Cynthia Stofone's skull, though which he injected hydrochloric acid into the frontal lobe before symphosotones fell unconscious Dahmer led the led the body into his bedroom where the th where the 31 year old Tony Hughes whom Dahmer had killed three days earlier lay naked on the floor okay according to Dahmer he believed that uh, the boy saw this body yet did not react to seeing the bloated corpse, likely because of the effect of the sleeping pills he had ingested, and the acid in his brain. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, that's fucked up, man. Symphostophone soon became unconscious, whereupon Dahmer drank several beers while laying alongside him before leaving his apartment to drink at a bar, then purchase more alcohol. So he returned in the early morning the next day, and um, walking towards his apartment, he discovered Sinfa Stofone sitting naked on the corner on 25th and State, talking to uh, Leon, Leo, with three distressed young women. So the boy was talking to women or whatever naked, standing near him. Dahmer approached the women and told them that Sinfa Stofone, who he referred to by the alias, John Hungman Hummung was his friend and attempted to lead him into the apartment by arm. The woman uh, to prevented him from doing this and, ex and said they phoned 911. So the police arrived and he, uh, he explained that it was his boyfriend, basically, and that he was drunk. And, uh, yeah... He said he was his 19-year-old boyfriend and that he was drunk. So the officers literally just told him, take him back inside or whatever, take care of him. And the ladies were like, I don't think that's a good idea because the kid obviously didn't look drunk or whatever. But, uh, yeah. One of the women also tried to tell the officers that the Symphostophone, Symphostophone, so I can't, yeah, I can't pronounce this, was um, bleeding from his rectum and that he had seemingly struggled against Dahmer's attempts to walk him to his apartment. The officer harshly informed her to butt out, shut the hell up, and to not interfere. That's on the officers right there. They should have took one look at that kid and was just fucking arrested Dahmer or something, man. Because, like, they ha they could have charged him with something. But, yeah, as I said, they uh, didn't do anything. And uh, he proceeded to uh, kill him. They, he, uh, yeah, fucking... Upon departure of the three of officers from his apartment, Dahmer again injected hydrochloric acid into... Uh, Cynthia Stofone's brain. On the second occasion, the inject in injection proved fatal. The following day, Dahmer took a day's leave from work to devote himself to the dismemberment of the bodies of Symphostotone and Hughes. He retained both victim skulls. So yeah, the police could have caught him right there or whatever, most likely. Um, in, on June 30th, Dahmer went to Chicago where he encountered a 20-year-old named Matt Turner at a bus station. Turner accepted Dahmer's offer to travel to Milwaukee for a professional photo shoot. Back at his apartment, he drugged and strangled and dismembered Turner and placed his head and internal organs in separate plastic bags in the freezer. Turner was not reported missing five days later on July 5th. Dahmer lured 23-year-old Jermaine Jermaine Wingberger 
from a Chicago bar to his apartment on the promise of spending the weekend with him. He drugged Wingberger and twice injected boiling water through his skull, sending him into a coma from which he died two days later. On July 15th, Dahmer encountered 24-year-old Oliver Lacey at the corner of 27th and Kilbourne. Lacey agreed to... Lacey agreed, Dahmer's ruse to pose, pose nude for photos, accompanying him back to his apartment yet again, where the pair engaged in tentative sexual activity before Dahmer drugged Lacey. On this occasion, Dahmer intended to prolong the time he spent with Lacey while alive after unsuccessfully attempting to render Lacey unconscious with chloroform. He phoned his workplace to request a day's absence. This was granted, although the next day he was suspended. Oof. Uh, after strangling Lacey, Dahmer had sex with the corpse before dismembering him. He placed Lacey's head and heart in the refrigerator and the skeleton in the freezer. Four days later, on July 19th, Dahmer received word that he was fired. Oof. Upon... Receiving this news, Dahmer lured 25-year-old Joseph Berhodov to his apartment. Berhodov was strangled and left laying on Dahmer's bed covered with a sheet for two days. On July 21st, Dahmer removed these sheets to find the head covered in maggots, whereupon he decapitated the body. Cleaned up the head and placed it in the refrigerator. He later acidified Baratodov's torso along with two other, two of the other victims killed within the previous month. Well, shit, my guy's on a mad killing spree, bro. A mad killing spree. So Dahmer was finally caught when he tried to lure three men to his apartment. Only one came. And that one was 32-year-old Tracy Edwards, who agreed to accompany him back to his apartment to take photos and drink with him. Upon entering Dahmer's apartment, Edward noted a foul odor and several boxes of hydrochloric acid on the floor, which Dahmer claimed to use for cleaning bricks. After some minor conversation, Edwards responded to Dahmer's requests to turn his head and view his tropical fish whereupon Dahmer placed a handcuff upon his wrist when Edwards asked what's happening Dahmer unsuccessfully attempted to cuff his wrists together then told Edwards to accompany him to his bedroom to pose for nude pictures while inside the bedroom Edward noted nude male pro posters on the walls and that videotapes of the Exorcist 2 were playing oh okay he also noted a blue 57-gallon drum in the corner from which a strong odor came from. Uh, Dahmer threatened him with a knife and uh, took nude photos in an attempt to appease Dahmer. Edwards unbuttoned his shirt, saying he would allow him to do so if he would remove the handcuffs and put the knife away in response to his promise. Dahmer simply turned his attention towards the TV. Edwards observed Dahmer rocking back and forth and chanting before turning his attention back to him. He placed his head on Edwards' chest and listened to his heartbeat, and with the knife pressed against his intended victim, informed Edward he intended to eat his heart. Oof. So, uh... He continued to uh, prevent Dahmer from attacking him. Edwards repeated that he was Dahmer's friend and that he wasn't going to run away because obviously Dahmer didn't want him to go anywhere. Edward had decided he was going to either jump from the window or run through the unlocked front door upon the next available opportunity. When Edwards next stated he needed to use the bathroom, he was asked if he could sit with a beer in the living room where there was air conditioning, Dahmer consented, and the pair walked to the living room. When Edwards exited the bathroom, inside the living room, Edwards waited until he observed Dahmer having a momentary lapse of concentration before requesting to use the bathroom again. When Edwards rose from the couch, he noted Dahmer was not holding the handcuffs. 
whereupon Edwards punched him in the face, knocking Dahmer off balance and ran out the front door. And then, um, he flagged down two cops at 11.30 p.m. on July 22nd, and the officers, uh, were told about the whole situation, and Edwards led them to the apartment where, uh, uh, Dahmer answered the door. He invited them all in, and he admitted to handcuffing Edwards, although he offered no explanation as to why he had done this. At this point, Edwards divulged to the officers that Dahmer had also brandished a large knife upon him, and that this had been happening in their bedroom. Dahmer made no comment to this uh, accusation, indicating to no to one of them officers that the key to the handcuff was in the bedside dresser. As Mahler entered the bedroom, Dahmer attempted to pass Mahler to himself to retrieve the key himself, whereupon the second officer pressed, um, he told him to back off, basically. So in the bedroom, Mahler noted, that's one of the cops, Mahler, he noted there were indeed a large knife beneath the bed, he also saw an open drawer which, upon closer inspection, contained sources of Polaroid pictures, many of which were of human bodies in various stages of dismemberment. Muller noted the decor indicated that they have been taken in, ver in the very apartment in which they were standing. Muller walked into the living room to show them the to show the pictures to his apartment, uttering the words, These are for real. Imagine that you're just um trying to help out this dude who is handcuffed and uh you find these pictures of dismembered bodies. That's something like straight out of a horror movie. So Dahmer, when he saw them holding the pictures, he tried to resist arrest. The officers overpowered him and uh, cuffed him and took him to jail. And uh yeah. For more they searched the apartment more thoroughly. And, um, they found a total of four severed heads in Dahmer's kitchen. A total of seven skulls, some painted, some bleached, were found in Dahmer's bedroom and inside a closet. They also found a blood tray at the bottom of his refrigerator, plus two human hearts and a portion of arm muscle, which was wrapped inside plastic bags on a shelf. Dahmer's freezer... In the freezer, they discovered an entire torso plus a bag of human organs and flesh stuck to the ice at the bottom. Holy! Elsewhere in his apartment, investigators discovered two entire skeletons, a pair of severed hands, two severed and preserved penises, a mummified scalp, and in a 57-gallon drum... Three further dismembered torsos dissolving in acid solution. A total of 74 Polaroid pictures detailing the dismemberment of Dahmer's victims were found. In the, in the reference to the recovery of body parts and artifacts in the um, apartment, the chief medical examiner later stated it was more like dismantling someone's museum than an actual crime scene holy that's uh fucking wild right there but yeah that's uh what all they found in his apartment so on july 23rd 1991 Dahmer was questioned by detective patrick kennedy as to the murders he had committed and the evidence found in his apartment and Dahmer, over the next two weeks told kennedy and later detective patrick murphy that uh he did all the murders he confessed to everything when combined totaled over 60 hours Dahmer waived his right to a lawyer presented throughout his interrogations adding he wished to confess all as he had created this horror and it only makes sense i do everything to put an end to it so yeah, like Edmund Kemper, he uh, confessed to absolutely everything. But uh, yeah. <clears throat> Dahmer admitted to engaging in necrophilia, necrophilia with several of his victims' bodies, including performing sexual acts with their, viscerated, with their eviscerated and dismembered bodies. 
in his bathtub, having noted that much of their blood pooled inside his victim's chest after death. Dahmer first removed their internal organs, then suspended their torso so the blood drained into the bathtub before dicing any organs he did not wish to retain and preparing the flesh from the body. The bones he wished to dispose of were pulverized or acidified with Soliex and bleach solution used to aid in the preservation of the skeleton and the skulls he wished to keep. In addition, Dahmer confessed to having consumed the hearts, liver, and biceps and portions of thighs of several victims killed within the previous year. But, uh, yeah. He, uh, uh, fucking, um, admitted to everything, so, you know. So, as I said in the beginning, he was, uh, sentenced to 16 life sentences, and, um, upon hearing of Dahmer's sentencing, his father, Loin, and his stepmother, Sherry, requested to be allowed a 10-minute private meeting with their son before he was transferred to prison to begin his sentence. The request was granted, and the trio exchanged hugs and well wishes before Dahmer was escorted away. Three months after his conviction, Milwaukee Dahmer was extradited to Ohio to begin to being tried for the murder of his first victim, and they got the life sentence for that, his 16th life sentence. And this was on May 1st, 1992. So when Dahmer was killed in the morning of uh, November 28th, 1994, he left his cell to conduct an assigned work detail, accompanied him with two fellow inmates, Jess Anderson and Christopher Scaver. The trio were left unsupervised in the showers of the prison gym for approximately 20 minutes and approximately 8.10 a.m. Dahmer was discovered on the floor of the bathrooms of the gym suffering from extreme head wounds. He had been severely bludgeoned about the head and face with a 20-inch metal bar. His head had also been repeatedly struck against the wall in the assault. Although Dahmer was still alive and rushed to a nearby hospital, he was pronounced dead one hour later. Anderson had also been beaten with the same instrument and died two days later of his wounds. So, um... What, uh, Jesse Anderson, Christopher Scaver killed them both. Word. On August 5th, 1991, as the nature and scale of Dahmer's crimes initially came to light, a candlelight vigil to celebrate and heal the community was attended by more than 400 people presented at the vigil were community leaders gay rights activists, and family members of the several of Dahmer's victims. Organizers stated the purpose of the vigil was to enable Milwaukee to share their feelings of pain and anger over what happened. So they mourned over this or whatever. The Oxford Apartments where Dahmer had killed 12 of his victims were demolished in November 1992. Yeah, I wouldn't want to live anywhere near there. The site is now a vacant lot. Alternate plans to convert the site into either a memorial garden, a playground, or to reconstruct new housing have failed to materialize. Yeah, I don't know what you would do with that, man. Put a hill there or something. Fuck. A monument. But the Dahmer estate was awarded to the families of 11 of his victims who had sued for damages. In 1996, Thomas Jacobson, a lawyer representing eight of the families, announced a plan, a planned action of Dahmer's estate. Although victims' relatives stated the motivation was not greed, the announcement sparked controversy. But, um, yeah, that's, uh, wild. Uh, his father is retired and now lives with his second wife, Sherry. Both have refused to change their surname and have professed their love for Dahmer in spite of his crimes. In 1994, his father published a book, A Father's Story, and donated a portion of the proceeds from his book to the victim's families. Most of the families showed support for Lodi's Loney's and Sherry's, although three families subsequently sued Loney, two for using their names in the book without obtaining consent, and the third family, that of Stephen Hicks, filed a wrongful death suit against Loney, Sherry, and the former wife, jo 
Joycey. Citing parental negligence as the cause of the claim. Yeah, they can't really sue him for that. They had no control over his actions. Joyce Flint died of cancer in November 20, Nove in November 2000. Prior to her death, she had attempted suicide on at least one occasion. Dahmer's younger brother David changed his surname and lives in anonymity. So, uh, yeah, that's uh, pretty wild right there. But uh, yeah, if you want to see uh, documentaries on him and movies, you can just search up Jeffrey Dahmer on YouTube or Netflix and I'm sure they'll come up. So yeah, that is Jeffrey Dahmer. Thank you for listening to this episode on the Murder House Radio Show. Check out the social medias and the sources in the description below. Make sure you hit the like and subscribe button. Once you hit the subscribe button, Hit the bell notification and select all to get all notifications if you are watching on YouTube. If you are watching on a podcasting platform, hit follow. See you next episode. This is your host X signing off.